This video is sponsored by Surfshark VPN. This is the fourth in a series of videos I'm making about Simplex, a solid rocket motor that I designed, built, and fired earlier this year. So far, we've talked about the design, propellant mixing, and how to make a nozzle. So today, we're talking about the opposite end of the rocket motor, the forward closure. The forward closure seals the top end of the rocket motor, and contrary to what you might have heard, fire is only supposed to come out of one end of the rocket motor. So let's hop into Onshape and get a little refresher on our design. This part is made primarily from 6061 aluminum. We have a bunch of holes around the side for M5 bolts to thread in and retain the part, and we seal the pressure with these red O-rings around the edge. We use two of them for safety. One is a primary, and another is a backup. There's a third O-ring at the top, which seals against the thermal liner of the motor. In the design video, we talked about why we need this, which is that we don't want the gas to escape out the top of the liner and go down against the case wall, which would disassemble our rocket motor. Around the bottom, we have three holes used for pressure transducers, which will measure the pressure inside the motor. And in the center, we have a large hole for an ignition bolt to thread in. We'll talk more about that later in the video, but let's start building. We're starting off the build with this massive chunk of 6061 aluminum stock material. And our first operation is to drill a little hole in the center. I mounted the stock material using blue tape on either side and CA glue in between the part and the bed. Come here, look at me, okay? I see you typing that comment about how you think blue tape is not an effective work holding strategy. What I want you to know from the bottom of my heart is that I can do it. I'm built different. We cut this pocket so we can mount it on the lathe chuck, which isn't large enough to grip around the outside. Then on the lathe, we slowly walk down the length of the stock to turn the outside diameter down. Not just to get the correct part size, but because the lathe carriage literally cannot fit under the part. It is too big otherwise. I need a new lathe. I'm kidding, I love my little eBay lathe. It's just sometimes we don't see eye to eye on how big these rockets should be. I faced off the part and after finishing the outside diameter, I started turning the liner slot. This slot gets an O-ring groove cut in it and much like the nozzle, I checked the fit with the actual parts as I went. Afterward, I turned two major O-ring grooves, also checking fits with those as I went. Next up, I center drilled the part and started a bore down through the part. This was going to be for the HEI bolt to sit in, but then I realized I wasn't using my time effectively and I should probably be doing this on the Tormach CNC mill. I blue taped it to the CNC again and I'm allowed to do this because as pre Previously discussed, I'm built different. Most of the tool path was a 3D adaptive path with a half inch end mill to keep tool load constant. And this lets me babysit the machine just a little less. While this is running, just to be clear, I do actually own toe clamps now. I have a better way to hold my work. Uh, so like better work holding is coming, but there are still more blue tape things to come as well. <laughs> now with the major shape work here done, we can move on to creating those radial bolt holes. We're gonna do it just like we did with the nozzle, but drilling these requires a lot more thought about exactly where the holes go. So here's the thing, we have a fixed nozzle position within the case based on the holes that we drilled in the last video. We also have a fixed position for the propellant grain because we already cut that liner down to length. So we're gonna have to find the forward closure position using those actual parts, but first we need to face the propellant grain. I'm facing it. This, this, is not a, this is not a very good joke. What I'm talking about is knocking off a little bit of the propellant grain on either side of it so that the nozzle and the forward closure can slide inside of the liner a bit. I thought about creating some type of fancy tool to knock down an entirely flat surface on the propellant grain. And if we were doing a lot of propellant grains, that would make sense because those errors in surface area will definitely stack up. But ultimately I ended up using a knife and lots of patience. As I chopped it down, I saved all of the chunks so that we could use them for igniters later or just burn them at far. For obvious reasons, we're doing this outside for safety. And as I went, I checked the fit with both the forward closure and the nozzle to make sure that we had clearance on either end. While the faces on the grains aren't flat, they're even enough to get the job done. 
With the grain now faced, we can line up all of the parts and cut the case to its final length. I did this using a horizontal bandsaw, which is great for cutting big tubes like this. I used a tool to deburr the inside edges of the tube, which helps protect the O-rings as they slide in, and now we can set the forward closure position. I loaded the nozzle, the propellant grain, then slid in the closure, and after double checking distances, I removed the nozzle and liner, and then drilled that same bolt pattern using the 3D printed drill guide I made. First we do the holes in the case, and then we do slightly smaller diameter holes in the forward closure, which get drilled and tapped as M5. The other thing I did on the inside of the case for both the nozzle and the forward closure is I got this fancy 90 degree drill chuck and chamfering bit and I knocked down the inside edges of each radial bolt hole. This helps the o-ring slide past the radial bolts without tearing. Okay, moving right along, let's talk about how we measure pressure inside of this motor. I drilled three holes in the forward closure and tapped them as quarter inch NPT, which you have to be super careful about. NPT is a tapered thread, which means you should never use the full length of the tap or your threads will end up too large. I didn't have the right type of tap wrench for this, so I just used some vice grips and elbow grease. The pressure transducers are these little guys, and they're good to about 3000 PSI, so we have plenty of headroom if the chamber pressure goes super high. I'm using three for super duper redundancy, and I don't think I would do it again this way. One pressure transducer is totally enough and three made it difficult to get that HEI bolt inserted. Okay, next, what is rule number one about solid rocket motors? I know you know this, I know this, let's say it together. You ready? No hot gas on aluminum. Five very critical words. Aluminum melts very easily, so let's insulate the bottom of this forward closure with a piece of linen phenolic. I started with a quarter inch sheet of the stuff and I turned it into a circle using the hole saw. Then I mounted it on my lathe chuck using the blessed wonderful blue tape method. On the lathe, I turned it down to the final diameter, then drilled a hole in the center for the HEI bolt to pass through. This part then got attached to the forward closure with RTV, which I applied and let cure for 30 minutes before attaching the two together. Finally, I drilled small holes in the phenolic at each one of the pressure transducer holes. These will get filled with protective grease before we fire the motor. Each hole is a slightly different size to see how that affects the readings. Now, I've mentioned this HEI bolt before, so let's talk about it. HEI stands for head end ignition, and it allows us to have the best of both worlds in terms of rocket motor ignition. By using an HEI bolt like this, we don't need to stick an igniter up the throat of the rocket motor to get it to light, and we also don't need to integrate the igniter days or weeks before we actually fire it, we can just take this bolt out to the launch pad, screw it in, and we're ready. So on the forward closure, this center hole gets coated in tap magic, and I take the longest, most terrifying and expensive M30 tap and start cutting threads with a huge tap wrench. I actually ended up cross-threading this bad boy at one point, and thankfully, because the threads are so big, I was able to clean up my mistakes later using a tiny bit on a Dremel. Now for the HEI bolt, which I'm considering to be part of the forward closure. This is a bolt size of M30, and it is made of stainless steel. To make it, I turned down about an inch of the threads just below the minor thread diameter, then I added grooves for primary and backup O-rings to seal against the hole walls in the forward closure, and voila, it should be plugged. On the inside of the bolt, I turned a large hole at the end and then slowly moved down to smaller and smaller drill bit sizes as we traveled further down the bolt. The smallest diameter is 1 8 inch, and I turned that down from the other side of the bolt. Now, it's a pretty small bit for a stainless steel part, and I used a good amount of tap magic, but you know, you don't, you don't, um, you don't want to push it too hard, buddy. I mean, if it, hey, if it, if it breaks off, it's gonna ruin the part completely. So just, hey, hold on, hold on, <laughs> be careful, man. Okay, hold on, stop pushing, stop pushing. That's really bad. That's really bad. I tried very, very, very hard to dissolve this drill bit out of this stainless steel part using alum powder, which, when dissolved in water, slowly eats away at the tool steel while leaving the stainless steel mostly untouched. For what it's worth, this definitely worked. Had I kept going, it probably would have removed the whole bit. It's just that it was very slow. Over about 30 hours of boiling this stuff in fairly concentrated water and alum powder, the bit like eroded about a half inch. That said, it made for some really pretty looking footage as it bubbled away a little bit at a time. Either way, I don't have the patience to wait for this, so I started work on a new HEI bolt from scratch. Now, while that's going, let's talk about why we taper that inner center hole. Let me get out a 
classic Photoshop cross-section to explain it. Okay, so here's our HEI bolt in the closure. One side is at atmospheric pressure and temperature, and the other side is basically in hell. Very hot gas, very high pressure, and oh boy does that pressure want to escape. We seal the pressure with those dual O-rings, and we prevent the hot gas from touching the rings with tight spaces and a generous amount of grease. On the inside, we have these slowly tapered holes, but it might be better for our illustration if we kind of like take the derivative and turn those tapers into a slope. The ignition wires are going to run up through this hole, and then we're gonna fill the whole thing with RTV to seal the pressure. When the pressure on the hot side rises, it pushes harder against that RTV, and because of the cone shape, it presses in hard against the wires, like radially. This is particularly important because the insulation around the copper wire is not a hermetic seal. It will not seal against that copper. So we have to actually push against that insulation to accomplish a good seal. The other option here is to strip the insulation off of the copper wires and coat them in enamel or something like that, but that's a more intensive process and it involves messing around with igniters, which I'm not really interested in doing. Moving on, the HEI bolt eventually gets a honeycomb mesh stuck to the end of it. This mesh is epoxied in place with a high temperature epoxy mixed up with 25% thermocells, which are a heat insulating additive. The high heat epoxy keeps the gas off of the stainless steel and away from the RTV inside the bolt. That aluminum mesh gets coated in a spicy ignition compound and the igniter leads are then threaded through the center of the HEI bolt and that whole volume is filled with RTV. Now I'm going to tell you exactly how to make a low mass, high heat flux chemical compound capable of starting a solid rocket motor. You first start out by taking the and you mix that in with the you're gonna let this sit in the oven for six hours at room temperature and then eight hours in the freezer. And while you're doing that, it's important to feed the neighborhood cat. Crucial step. Once that's done, you're gonna mix in your with your and a little bit of table salt. You can add some parsley and oregano to taste and then a little bit of cream cheese if you're looking for extra flavor. I'm personally a fan of that. Then you're gonna cast that onto your ignition substrate and boom, you've got an igniter. You're going to see more about this in an upcoming video, but that HEI bolt setup worked perfectly in a pressure test up to about 1000 PSI and I'm sure it could go higher if we had decided to push it. The next video, by the way, is about building the test stand for Simplex and I'm very excited to show you that process. But before that happens, we have to talk about the sponsor for today's video. This video is sponsored by Surfshark VPN. Oh, hey, what's up? I'm just trying to find a video to watch on my favorite streaming platform, but it says the video isn't available in my country. Surfshark VPN. What? Surfshark VPN. Okay, now I don't, I don't like that. Oh my God, I'm here to solve all your problems using Surfshark VPN. Uh... Have you ever wanted to watch content that wasn't available in your country? I mean, yeah, I, ge I guess right now. Have you ever wanted to keep your online identity safe by encrypting all of the information sent between your device and the internet? I mean, I, I, I wouldn't say it's my main concern at the moment, but yeah, that, that would be helpful. Well, here's the thing, champ. A virtual private network like Surfshark VPN can swap your location with any other location around the globe, which means you can virtually travel around the globe online. It keeps your data safer through encryption and for streaming services where you want more flexibility, you can access a literal world of content using Surfshark VPN. Pretty cool, right? You know, I, I guess that is pretty nice. Yeah, that's what I'm saying, man. And if you wanna get an extra three months free of Surfshark VPN, you can do that by using the code BPS space at checkout. Plus, Surfshark VPN offers a 30 day money back guarantee, so there's no risk to try. And there's a link in the description down below if you wanna check it out. Hey, real, real quick, what do you mean by description down below? Okay, dude, you're in a YouTube skit. There's lights all over the place. I mean, you're wearing a microphone. Anyway, one more time, that code is BPS space that you can enter at checkout and there's a link in the description down below. Thank you very much to Surfshark VPN for sponsoring today's video. I'm gonna be honest, dude, it sounds like this is a pretty good deal. You know, it really is. Bye. Um, what do I, what do I do now? And when did I? When did I